Hey everyone, welcome. Got an interesting episode for you guys today. We're going to be talking about causal inference. Regarding this new title, in collaboration with Pi Publisher, with the title Causal Inference and Discovery in Python. First things first, I want to talk about the author. The author's name is Alexander Molek, and he's been a machine learning researcher and consultant for years. He's gained a lot of experience working for Fortune 100, Fortune 500, as well as in a thousand companies across Europe, United States, and Israel. So we're talking about an author with a big profile coming from a wide range of a variety of different knowledge pools. And me personally, I definitely am very grateful to review this book and to provide an honest feedback. So before we jump into the actual content and things I learned from this book, I just want to share with you guys a personal story. I briefly had the interest of stepping into causal inference during my graduate study. Unfortunately, I didn't end up choosing it because I feel like to establish causal inference, it's very difficult to get a pair of observations that has all the other factors exactly the same. So I always felt like, hey, if you can't control all these other factors, then the assumptions, the premise that you are setting for that causal argument to hold may or may not be true. That was one of the conflict that I personally struggled in myself before. But across the years, I definitely see the importance of this field, and this book is a great opportunity to come back to it. Another personal struggle that I have with causal inference is causal inference in time series kind of feels like playing God to me. Because think about it. If you're going to predict tomorrow's stock price is whatever, X, Y, Z, right? Then you know that it's just a prediction in a single timestamp, and that may or may not be true. That's why people do Monte Carlo simulation, right? because they don't want to rely on just one point, they want to rely on a whole distribution. So that's kind of where my time series training comes in, which makes it a little bit difficult to accept the causal inference in time series. I always felt like, how big of an ego do I need to have to be able to say, oh yeah, because of XYZ, therefore stock price will absolutely go up. Well, you don't know that. At least I don't think I know that. I certainly do not think anybody should Thing that they believe in that because then you're in the region of okay let's play god you know because we know everything me personally based on everything i've seen in finance i don't think that's the case so that gave me a lot of personal struggle during my earlier career in cosmo inference however i think it's interesting that this book laid out all those assumptions and certainly give me a new perspective of what can be done in the field of causal inference so let's jump right in, right? First part of this book, very straightforward. It immediately dive in to talk about what is causal inference, what is the challenges, and what can be done, what are the basic concepts. From there, it's very important to understand the differences between observational, interventional, counterfactual queries, and distributions. And the book will teach you how to use those ideas to put together a model, to put together an argument to solve certain questions and specifically to establish the connections between something simple, say a linear regression model, and something more visual, say a graphic model. And then from there, it leads to causal models. And me personally, I had a lot of fun reading the first part because it talked about forks and chains. And those are tools that you can use to establish the interconnections between one event to another, which also let you guys know a small secret we're using conditional probabilities. So it's a lot of Bayesian framework. For those of you who are for those of you who are Bayesian people out there, this will be a really fun part for you to read about. So part two of this book, you will dive in a little bit deeper, and specifically you'll be using knowledge established using the first part of the book to talk about how to establish causal inference. So this part uses a lot of DAGs, right? DAG is short for Directed Acyclic Graph. It's one of those arrows that you draw between two circles, meaning that from one event you can go to the other, and certain mathematical definition going behind those DAG arrows. So it merely gives you that visualization of what can be done by looking at certain information, certain events in your database, and how they're connected with each other. And then one fun thing in part two of this book is the author demonstrated the exercise of using 
do y library in Python to show you how to estimate the causal inference. Basically, we're talking about two circles, and there's an arrow going in between. And that arrow can actually using this package, which I thought was pretty cool to mention. And on top of that, the book has complementary GitHub repo in which you can find and download the Python code in a Jupyter notebook for you to run the package. So throughout reading the book, one central thing I'm getting in highlighting with what I said in the beginning, that personal challenge that I'm having in an earlier point of my career, is that the causal inference or causal argument is established based on sets of assumptions, of which one of the most important assumptions is that there does not exist any other confounding variables. Or some people might nickname it the non-confounding variable assumption. In other words, what it's really saying is what you observe in the data is everything that this thing has. And there's no other information or certainly no other factors out there that's not observed, that's not in the data set, that affects your treatment and the outcome variable. Because if that does exist, then whatever it is you're doing within this data set is not complete, right? So first of all, the assumption to do causal inference kills that scenario, right? It gets that scenario off the table. So now you're within the world of what you do observe. That's the data set that you observe, uh, whether if it's some medical data or students taking extracurriculum classes of getting higher grades, whatever data set that you're observing, that assumption coined that this is the, all the information you have in that universe. And then on top of that, you of course want to know what is the treatment, right? And perhaps the treatment is a certain drug if you're working on medical data. The third thing, which is also something that I believe is very difficult, and oftentimes you don't have a perfect parallel, is the case and control. So I say case and control loosely, but in here what we're really looking for is a pair of observation. You want to find or establish a pair of observation such that you send one observation to do the treatment and the other don't. So to know that the final result after the treatment has a difference, and that difference is something that you can draw a conclusion of, you need to know that these two pairs is exactly the same. They're almost like a twin. They're identical. Now, of course, not all the data set give you that, right? You can't rewind the clock back and close the wound of this patient and put a tumor back and then observe what happened because you already done the surgery, right? The treatment is already done. You don't have the other alternative scenario that you can observe as a comparison, right? So in observational study, I'm not entirely sure you can theoretically getting a 100% pair. Now, of course, I'm not an expert, right? For those of you out there who are doing this kind of studies, please let me know if that's wrong. But there are, however, different methods to help you establish something maybe is not 100% same, but perhaps 99% similar, right? Uh, for example, we have similarity scores to measure two sentences. I don't know. Um, that's an example in natural language processing. Or perhaps in observational studies, you have propensity score matching, right? You can use a propensity score to see which pair of observation is close to each other. Now, that's just one example. There are, of course, tons of other examples that you could use to dig out which pair of observations in your data set are very close to each other, are very similar to each other. And that pair of observations is going to be the twin that you observe. One is for treatment, and the other one, you don't touch it, you leave it alone. And in the end, you observe the treatment effect. Or if you're doing sampling, you can observe the average treatment effect. So this way, you can establish some sort of causal inference. You say, hey, look, we don't have any other confounding variables that affect these two things together, right? So that's out of the picture. So it's not that. Therefore, whatever it is, however improbable, must be in the data set. And then you measure the average treatment effect of certain pairs that perhaps you established using propensity score matching. And then you can say, okay, the average treatment effect is X based on this treatment. And then from there, you can quantify what that difference is with and without the treatment. 
So before the end of this video, I just want to show you guys a small experiment that I found on their notebook presented in complementary of this book. In this notebook, they upload this data set called ML Earnings. It's an earnings data set measuring different earnings based on age and whether you took a machine learning class or not. So it's a very simple data set. The roles are the observations. We have one column age. For example, this person's age is 19, uh, this one's 28, so on and so forth. The second column is Boolean, so it can only be true and false. And the third column is earnings. These are all numerical values for the third column, and that's how simple the data set is. So we're talking about three columns. So for a conventional linear regression model, let's say you're not looking at that Boolean variable. You can very easily build a regression model using age as a factor, right? And you can regress over age on earnings. So your dependent variable will be earnings, and you can compute the linear coefficients to see what kind of numbers that you're working with. And then you can work out the R-square, you can work out the p-value, and that sort of thing. But how do you turn this into a causal argument? You need to partition the data differently, right? Because now you have this Boolean variable. You can then separate the data set into two linear regression models. The first one is those who took a class, meaning that this column in the middle is true, the other one being false. So you have two linear regressions dependent on that Boolean variable in the middle. And linear regression is just looking at the expectation. So given a certain x value, in this case it's age, you have some sort of expectation of what the earnings should be. And guess what? In this case, since you have two linear regression models, one condition, and in this case, you're conditioning on the Boolean variable in the middle, so the linear regression for the observations that took a course will probably have a higher expectation than the other one who does not take a course. So something like that is interesting, right? But then here, let's see how the author proposed to carve out the diagram. So after you work out a diagram using causal model, which is a Python package proposed in this book, and you're going to see some graph like this. On the left, it's the node took a class or took a course. On top is age, bottom is earnings. So this arrow connects between age and take a class. That quantifies the probability that you go from age to the class. Or perhaps at a certain age, you start to take a class, right? So that's what that arrow is talking about. And if you take a class, it's likely that you have this level of earnings. Versus if you do not take a class, you're just going from your age to the earnings, then you probably have a different model. So then the idea is this actually helps you to do inference. If you are a person who has not taken a course, then to measure your earnings, we can only use your age. Then you are going from age to the earnings directly in that arrow. But if you took the class, then you're going to go from age to the class and then from the class to the earnings. So that puts you on the other arrows. So this way, we're actually able to make predictions. A new person walks in the door, we can just ask him, what's your age? Have you taken this class? And we have an educated guess of what the earnings should be. So I thought that was interesting, and to use this baby example to show you guys that this kind of framework can be done. This kind of argument can be established. And then on top of that, it's causal. So with that being said, I hope you like this video. If you like it, give a like and hit that subscribe button. And I'll see you guys in the next episode.